you're watching the Jenny Lynn Show, and I'm Jenny Lynn Gleave, your host. And today, you're probably wondering why I'm sitting in the wrong seat. Well, actually, I'm not. But it is my privilege and honor to be sitting here today with Lloyd LaQuesta, with whom I'm sure you're all familiar. Except today, I'm the one asking the questions. Lloyd, you thank mean, you. Do you mean I, I'm sitting in your seat? <laughs> well, normally you're the one that's sitting here and the other person is in the hot uh, seat. Yeah, that, today, you are in the hot seat. Yeah, that's, uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, time here, Jenny, because I'm, I'm more used to asking the questions and answering the questions. That's and, true. And that's my whole point. So let's see how this is going to unfold. Because I've been told that seat is really hot. Well, we'll see. <laughs> All depends on what you ask to do this time. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come here today. And I'm especially honored because I'm your first television interview since your retirement from working with Fox 2 News, right? Yeah, you know, and there's an assumption here. I don't know if everyone knows who I am and actually why you're interviewing me. Because uh, uh, I'm, I'm a retired journalist, uh, although I'm still active somewhat. But I, I was a journalist for some 40 years, and uh, it was actually three months to the day that I did my last newscast. Uh, I worked for Channel 2, KTVU TV, and um, it's interesting to be back in front of a television camera again. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad I'm the one bringing you back here. I think that if you've done anything for 40 plus years, that's you. That's who you are. And based on what I know of you from the times I followed, you've done a remarkable job. And I hope one day that I can be half as good as you were, or you are. Well, it's a, it's a way, you know, when people ask me about that, it was, it was simply someone following his dream. And um, from a very early age, I had a dream of becoming a journalist. And uh, uh, my career started in newspapers, it went into radio and then eventually television. And I was very fortunate in many ways that I, I got to live out my dream. And I was doing exactly what I wanted to do when I was a 16-year-old high school student who uh, took a journalism class, just a journalism class just out of the blue. And I found that I just loved it. I loved the deadline pressure. I loved talking to people. I loved finding out stories. And I was, my inspiration at that time really was by my high school journalism teacher, a woman named Virginia Bailey, who, when I look back on it, she was a uh, retired newspaper reporter. Okay. And uh, Mrs. Bailey was the one that gave me the words that I'll always remember. She said, um, you have talent, you have abilities, you can make a living out of writing. And I awesome. base, uh, m even though I w eventually wound up in television, it was all about writing. Good writing is the basis of uh, co good communication. And when I teach my students now, because I'm a professor at San Jose State, I say, I don't care whether you plan to go into television or media, as they call it, but it all comes down to being able to write simple sentences and putting words together so that they mean something. I think it's so important to have an encouraging teacher who really sees what your talents and your gifts are and kind of help to nurture it. Because I have lots of friends and I have had some teachers myself who kind of demotivated me as a person and I see yeah. them do it to people. I think you look up toward your teacher as someone that is kind of leading you. And when that person puts a spoke in your wheel, mm -hmm. sometimes you really have to have belief in yourself to forget what they say and to continue along to achieve those goals that you've set for your life. I saw an interview with Lady Gaga and she was told she couldn't sing and the rest is history. Yeah. So that's a good example of not letting people, you know, rain on your parade. Well, in my case, I think um, I probably exceeded expectations of what people saw of me. Um, I'm Filipino American. Uh, but I was born and raised in Hawaii. My parents are immigrants. My father was a uh, sugarcane plantation worker who came at the age of 14 to work in the fields of Hawaii. My mother uh, came at a much younger age and then she wound up becoming a nurse and we know how there are so many Filipino nurses. Well, she's at that time one of the first Filipino nurses uh, in, in that field in Hawaii. Really? So, uh, 
So I have that background, and, and when I, um, people ask me, so how did, how did journalism wind up in your, well, growing up in Hawaii was probably one of the, the best experiences that a person can have. But I never re really realized what a paradise it was, because as much time I spent on the beaches, I spent time on, in the libraries also. I enjoyed reading. I enjoyed reading books. I enjoyed being transported to other parts of the world through literature. And of course, reading evolved into writing, and then I started writing a lot. I used to write these essays uh, that the American Legion would have about what it means to be an American. Um, we, when we eventually moved to the mainland, Southern California, uh, I um, was at a loss of actually what I wanted to do. So I found my, my goal in, in high school, as I said, but at the time, I think, uh, most people viewed me as a brown kid who was probably going to become some kind of vocational profession, you know, whether it's working on cars or something, and uh, never saw me as doing what I eventually became. In fact, even to this day, some people say, you know, God, it's, so, it's surprising what Lloyd did with his life. Well, that's the key, you know, what you do with your life. Um, everything sort of motivates around what kind of uh, aspirations you have. I never thought I could do what I did. Are but you serious? I, I, never, I, I never really thought that I could achieve what I did. And I, I think a lot of it was, you know, there, there was a lot of determination that I had, but a lot of it is luck also. And it's like anything in, in life, luck plays a role in that. But if you have the will and the passion to, pr to pursue something, then with luck, you can succeed. Um, I just regret that when I look back on my career, when, once I left, I'm still one of the few Asian American men that wor worked in American television in a major market. And uh, I don't know whether I served enough of a role model to bring more people like me into the business. But it's, it's, it's not an easy business and not for everyone. Um, I was, as I say, I was, I was very, very lucky. Well, I have some questions I want to ask you. And one of them is, why are some stories sensationalized by the news media? And a good example is a few weeks ago when Prince Harry was photographed naked in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Why is it that, as a media person, why is it that some, some of these stories get so much hype and sensation? So, first of all, there's got to be a distinguished uh, between news and the media. Right. There's two separate things here. Oh, really? So okay, tell us. When we talk about the media, we can also talk about things like TMZ and the sort of uh, trash type of television shows that are out there. Right. Not necessarily news. Right. But then again, what is news? What is news? News is what's interesting, yes. different, worthy for someone's attention. And then the other thing you have to realize is that the media is also a business. Right. And the object is to get as many eyeballs watching that television set or watching a specific program so that you can generate some kind of money. I always said that every night when I did a newscast, I, I was sort of the filler in between the commercials because that's, <laughs> that's what made the whole wheel roll right. was that the money that came in from, from advertising. So is Prince Harry's escapades in Las Vegas, or the latest one now, which I think a French newspaper has uh, released, are topless pictures of Kate Middleton. Yes, so disgusting. People, I hear that all the time about sensationalism and um, the fact that, that the news carries it. Well, it's, it's two different animals in many ways. There's, there's hard, straight news, and then there's sort of the, what I call the trash element. But we live in a free society. Yeah. And people should have the right to choose whatever they want. If people want to watch that, then far be it for me to say you shouldn't be watching that. And when you look at numbers and everything is ratings, if people are so upset with these type of elements, why are the ratings so high on these shows? Well, Someone's watching. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a segment of our population that's totally into that. Now, if you turn on the television 
and they kind of preview what's to come in the news. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of placed like at the bottom of the list or toward the bottom, right before something you're waiting to hear. So you're almost subjected to watching it. If you know what, if you get what I'm saying. No, I, th I, I believe that, you know, we all have the ability to turn off the television set. We all have the ability to turn off the computers. There's no one's forcing, no one's holding a gun to your head to say, watch this. I agree, but sometimes it's something that's really critical that you want to hear, that it's, that's preceding it. So that well, you I, are I, waiting to hear this particular story, but they continue to keep on giving you clips of whatever the sensational story is. And a lot of times... For me, at least in my humble opinion, is not worth that much airtime. And again, that's subject to debate. You know, if, um, for, for instance, if you're a personality and a public personality, and if you do something, uh, should it be censored? Who, who's to make the decision right. that that should not be shown? Right. Now, right now, the media is under close scrutiny because of uh, because what's happening in the Middle East. There is this... Um, there's this movie called Muslim right, Innocence right. that has unfortunately caused the death of four Americans, right. including the ambassador to Libya, and is causing riots, tension throughout the Middle East. Now, did that person have the right to make that movie? Did that person have the right to put it on YouTube? Did YouTube have the right to air that? Um, well, I totally disagree. I totally disagree with what that movie has done. I don't think anyone want, out there wants a government in particular yeah. to say, this is what you can watch, this is what you can't watch. It's up to each individual person to make up their own mind, in my opinion. I do not want to live in a society where I'm told you cannot watch this or have a government that will clamp down on a media entity because it ran something. Yeah. There's what we call the First Amendment in this country. So and what? You know, okay, sorry. So, so it's, you know, in many ways, it's each and every one of us have to take responsibility for what our viewing habits are. And if we disagree with what is being put out there, then we work towards changing things. Hmm. I, I think too many of us just sort of sit back and say, look what, what the media is doing. Uh, it's too easy to blame the messenger. Yeah, I was just asking uh, because you were someone who was in the media or reporting the news and I was trying to understand why some stories are sensationalized and usually they're the trashy stories. So. Sensationalized in the very fact that it just put on the air. And is, it's over is, and is, over is, and over. You keep hearing about it every day. You're like, oh my God, enough is enough. How is that serving anybody to keep reporting this? But anyway, I don't want to waste all of my well, time. Well, uh, and you. again, I will, I will say this again. The public has the ultimate power. If you turn off the television, if you stop right, watching, if you turn on the computer, these are companies that realize that and they get the message. Mm -hmm. So I the see. ultimate power still rests in the public. Right. All you have to do is not watch. Well, I guess there's yeah. just a segment of the population that's driven by this stuff, you know, I guess. And I just happen to be one of the unfortunate <laughs> lesser numbers because I don't find it. It doesn't do anything for me. Uh, granted, but, you know, little things like some what you, you may call sensational, it, uh, it's fodder for uh, people when, it, when we get together at cocktail parties and everything. And if you're not aware of certain things, you kind of feel out of it sometimes. Uh -huh. and, in, and in this constant uh, age of information that we have, it's not just television. It's also my, my also um, uh, one of the things that really has bothered me is, is for instance, uh, certain as aspects of social media and the Internet. Now, there are things that are put out there that do not go through the normal role of responsible journalism. There are no gatekeepers, so to speak. You could put out a message out there, and it could go worldwide, and there's no filter there. The fact-checking, no one checks whether or not this is right or wrong. So it, it's really incumbent on all of us to be very, very responsible about what we read and, and view and then what we pass on as so-called truth. Yes, I agree with you. So here's a question I have for you. During your career, I mean, I have lots, but I'd like to answer By the way, to you know, this, this is very interesting that I've, I find because uh, 
since I retired, <laughs> I, I, I led a career which most people all said that, you know, Lloyd was very, very fair and, and unbiased. And, and, and now that I'm not necessarily a everyday working journalist, I find that I express myself more about certain hard fast feelings. <laughs> Why is that? And, and one, because I, I don't, um, I took a role for a long time as a journalist that it wasn't, it wasn't my personal opinion that mattered. It was presenting both sides of an issue and letting the public decide for themselves. Right. That changed in our media, as, we, as you know, mm -hmm. because now it's become more of a, an entertainment type of thing and to get the ratings more. So then, uh, and it was during when I started out to just give a fair and balanced account of the news. Right. That has become clouded now so much because of the, the whole aspect of um, constant 24-hour uh, information and getting more and more people to watch. Um, everything that I say, of course, we should know that's my opinion now, and it doesn't necessarily reflect anyone else uh, that that's behind me, but. I do enjoy the fact that I have a, I feel a certain uh, liberation now of being able to express things which I never did before. So welcome to the real world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to find out, during your career, did you ever interview a surreptitious person? How did you generally handle people who were cagey, nebulous, and just overly protective with their answers? Well, my, my philosophy always was to respect the uh, person that you're interviewing, number one. I've interviewed, uh, I've interviewed the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and believe me, that was not easy. But I always kept it on a straight, professional, objective tone, just for the, to have them express their side. Now, if, if I knew that someone was out and out lying, because the facts didn't add up, then I would sort of try to bring him out more and see what he, he or she would express and whether that would expose that person even further. Okay, because I know sometimes you ask a person a question and they skirt it and, and it's not because the question was so outrageous, it's because some people just don't often want to answer it, mm -hmm. um, answer the question. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know how you handle those people, because sometimes it's because they don't want to be offensive because they think the answer will be offensive. It's a lot of different reasons why. Yeah. I just wondered how you handled so, them. So in television, you know, it, it's uh, the added thing of the, the visual effect. I can, an, I can ask a question of certain people, and they, while they, ask, they answer the question verbally, their body language, their gestures, are showing a different aspect of that. So many times television is able to bring that out and again the audience is influenced. So look at that person, he's saying that but he's lying. I never said that, but just the way the person is answering a question uh, sort of may bring that out. Um, I, I also think that a good interviewing technique is that uh, after a while if you, if you keep on grilling someone and grilling someone and you're not getting anywhere, move on. Right. Well, that's no. what I do normally, although I haven't had that experience yet since I'm doing this. But you have been in the reporting news business for over 42 years, right? Mm -hmm. And you've covered some wars. You actually well, were at some war zones. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, I don't, you know, <laughs> when you say uh, in a war zone, I mean, uh, the, the most closest, I think, that, you know, really scared me was covering the LA riots. Okay. And I, 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 I was there for the Rodney King riots. I was there when shooting was going on. I was walking up to people who were looting and, and walking out with, with scads of merchandise and holding a gun. That's what uh, I want to hear about. Tell me about it. How did well, you deal with it as a young journalist? As you deal with it, first of all, as a journalist, um, these kind of stories are what you are trained you spent your lifetime training for because these are the the big stories as a all true journalists want to be there for the big big story and it, it just it gets our adrenaline going of and we, we try to live by our wits and everything um, but I always my code was always there is no story worth my life <laughs> and there is no story worth my life so I always knew when to back off and when to just say I'm turning the camera off 
you don't have to don't worry that nothing's going to happen um, but I can't there's no formula on covering stories like this it's just it's a lot of it is street smarts mm -hmm. so knowing I, how to how to carry yourself in a, in, a, in a situation that's very potentially dangerous right so in those 42 years which of your experiences have left the most indelible marks and why well I've told this story numerous times but there is there is one story that sort of influenced the way I pursued my career and it happened maybe a good 15 years into my career uh, and this is a story that did not win any awards it was not anything different or special but it had a very profound impact on how I view the job that I did uh, it was in the 80s and it was around Christmas time and I was sent to Stanford University Stanford Medical Center uh, to talk to a family it was during the early phases of heart transplants and there was a family from Castro Valley that was holding a vigil for the patriarch of the family who needed a heart he was dying he needed a heart so the family was basically making an appeal to the public to think about organ donation so when I came out of my live shot one of the things I did was just off, off the top of my head I reached into my wallet and I pulled out my card with a little pink dot on it and I said at this time of the year when a lot of people are into giving things you might want to think about signing one of these cards although if it's given to someone you will never see that person because you've given the ultimate gift of life good television <laughs> a few weeks later I'm in my office and the phone goes off and a woman says to me Mr. LaQuesta I want to ask you about uh, a story you did recently I said you know ma'am I do a lot of stories so no it's about a family that was waiting for a heart yeah. for their father so I said yes so this woman said I was watching that night and I want you to know that a few hours after your broadcast my daughter was involved in an accident and declared brain dead Wow! and even in my deepest grief I remembered what you said and I called Stanford and donated my daughter's lung and heart. How special! Of course, like any reporter, I was stunned and my immediate reaction was, can I come over and do an interview with you and do a story about this? And she said, no, I don't even want you to know my name, but I just want you to know that what you say and other journalists say has an effect on at least one person. I was that one person. So I've carried that story with me and I, I pass it on to young journalists because I want the realization that everything we do can affect someone mm -hmm. to the positive or to the negative. It's a heavy responsibility. That's the power of the media. Right. And if we have that always in our mind, then we will think twice before we put something out just willy-nilly well you're not gonna believe it but we only have five minutes left or less than. has it been that wow can you believe it this is what <laughs> happens when you're having fun always but what I would like to ask you before we close out the interview during your career have you ever been so intimidated by someone that you were interviewing that you were not able to conceal it and what consequences did you I experience frankly, out of that. I frankly can't say that I've ever been intimidated by anyone and I've done Good. presidents on down but I haven't done my ultimate interview and someday I will. And which, what is that? I'd like to interview God if there is a God. Well Lloyd all I have to tell you is you probably will but we're not going to get to watch it. <laughs> and and before, um, before we close out now that you're no longer a news active news media reporter for Fox 2 News or any other big network you're just teaching now mm -hmm. do you ever wake up and miss that buzz of running out there with your camera climbing a tree to get a story about a monkey yeah. or yeah I do I mean I, I, I miss the adrenaline rush sometimes but most of all I miss the socialization and the camaraderie that I had with my fellow journalists but it was time like everything in life there comes a time 
and I like just kicking back, enjoying life now, rather than pursuing it as I did. Right, and what would you say to a person, 18 years old, 15 years old, someone in your classroom right now, that wants to follow in your footsteps? Pursue, what would you say to them? Pursue your dreams, mm -hmm. and you can uh, perhaps attain it, but lead a balanced life. And what would you say would be the negative aspects of this entire experience for you that you think should be shared? Because I don't care what anybody says, there's positives and negatives yeah, I, and everything. Yeah, I, I sort of touched on it. Uh, it. It had an effect on my personal life, and I paid a heavy price for that. Uh, and I, I tell people you have to have a balanced life. It's not your life alone. You bring a lot of people along with you, and you cannot neglect those who are around you. So briefly, can you tell us how they do that? How can they do that? It's, it's, it's a simple act of assessment. As we progress through life, we all need to stop every once in a while mm -hmm. and take, take stock of what, where we are, what we're doing, and make an assessment. And can you tell me one of the funniest days that or funniest times that you've experienced as a, <laughs> as, as a journalist and a reporter? Well, uh, the one that probably people in the Bay Area remember is when I, I went down live on camera and slipped on black ice. I didn't know that. <laughs> it happened. It, and I, it wound up on the, on the nation's best boop, bloopers show or whatever. But uh, live on camera, I went down. Well, Lloyd, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed hearing this side of your life um, today on the show. And thank you for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. Hopefully, if you are someone who's got an interest in pursuing a career in journalism or in reporting and the media, whatever aspect of it, hopefully Lloyd has shared something today to encourage you, to guide you. And Lloyd, continue to do what you've been doing. Because you're not with Fox anymore doesn't mean your job is done. I think it's only done when you are done. Thanks to my crew and thanks to everyone for watching us today. See you later.